the interface of the analog and the digital then, you know. As, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Just, sorry, I just want to coordinate a bit. Sorry, I, I'm holding the mic because the sound comes from the mic. So, Nick, um, okay. Um, uh, Marco and Tiziana, they're going to make, uh, I guess, uh, well, an intro or, or something. They're going to say something about your book, right? And uh, raise a couple of issues. So we spared you to do like uh, a book talk or whatever. We're going to keep it interactive as you wish. Okay, to, to also the students are coming. I just want to ask Tiziana, because um, I know Tiziana has a slide, so, so I was just wondering whether we should start from Tiziana or from Marco. You guys decide, for me it's the same. Tiziana, what?
this. So this has been uh, an exciting semester. This is going to be uh, even more exciting ending note to the semester. I want to say that I am particularly happy to us tonight, a discussion around uh, uh, white site uh, um, visual uh, politics and practices of whiteness, uh, the latest book uh, uh, by Nicholas Mears, who have released uh, very recently by, by MIT Press. I'm very happy that we have the uh, two guests of honor uh, joining us tonight, uh, Tiziana Terranova from uh, Università degli Studi di Napoli L'Orientale and uh, Marco De Seris, uh, who is here with us in person from Scuola Normale Superiore di Firenze. Uh, they're both uh, um, interested in Nick's works and uh, we are part of a collective of friends uh, and peers and colleagues who are very interested in uh, disrupting and deconstructing these practices of whiteness. So we are, I feel, extremely happy to be here, even if not everybody's in person discussing uh, Nick's work. I also want to say that uh, I'm particularly happy because uh, uh, tonight uh, we have our students and I, uh, this semester I've been teaching a class in uh, war terrorism and violence in visual culture in which we made an extensive use uh, of uh, Mirzov's uh, work. We have read many essays, Nick, uh, starting from, uh, I mean, uh, Intro to Visual Culture, um, your essay on Abu Ghraib, and also Spaces of Appearance on uh, Black Lives Matter. So I, I feel that uh, for, for my students, this should be really um and a happy accident that you are featured uh, within the lecture series. So I hope they get a chance to uh, ask you questions. And also we have our, our digital media culture classes joining us tonight, uh, besides many faculty and staff from John Cabot University. Um, so for me, I, Nick Mirzoev, I mean, I, I, I want to make like a very short introduction. We know him for his work. He's a professor of media culture and communication at NYU in New York. But for me, I like the way in which he defines himself being a visual activist, because actually his work has been informed not only by theorizing certain issues that are uh, very central uh, at the core of the discipline of visual culture, but also in disrupting um, some practices such as the practice of uh, seeing white throughout his uh, curatorial practice and his own activism. Uh, what I was very inspired by reading uh, uh, Mirzov's book uh, was this idea that uh, another world is visible. This reminded me of another world is possible, which used to be the slogan of uh, uh, anti-globalization movements at the beginning of the 2000s, which I took actively part on. So another world is visible. What does it mean? How can we detect, first of all, practices of whiteness that are embedded within uh, pop culture, visual culture, and then how can we disrupt them uh, with our own work as uh, scholars, uh, journalists, uh, curators, activists, and most of all, citizens. So I think this for me was uh, one of the most interesting points in Nick's work, but I want to leave the, we, we get to discuss this later, I want to leave the floor to Tiziana Terranova, um, who's gonna make an introduction to the book. And I believe, yes, so she has a visual presentation. So please uh, welcome Tiziana Terranova. Hi, okay. I managed to unmute myself. Uh, so yes, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thanks to Donatella della Ratta and John Cabot University for the initiative, taking the initiative in organizing uh, the presentation of uh, this, uh, this outstanding book, uh, uh, Nicolas Mirzoff, White Sight. Uh, I also have uh, used in the past and keep drawing on Nick's uh, book in my cultural studies and digital media courses, I remember, uh, when I came back uh, to Naples, uh, uh, working in Italy after my time in the UK, uh, one of the first uh, texts I used in my courses was watching Babylon, which was about the war in Iraq, and it was very important uh, in that moment, uh, that the kind of analysis of uh, visual culture is a very materially grounded uh, uh, assemblage, uh, you know, Humvee cars, uh, you know, suburban architecture, so... 
uh, his work on visual culture has been important for our PhD students as well. Uh, and uh, watching Babylon is one of my personal favorite before this one, before I read this one. So uh, as Donatella said, we are also in the process of formalizing uh, uh, a new research network or center uh, that includes uh, John Cabot in Rome, uh, the Scuola Normale Superiore in Florence, uh, Kafoska University in Venice, and L'Orientale in Naples. Uh, we are thinking of this uh, research uh, network as a space, assembling scholars interested in the intersection of digital technologies, contemporary cultures, and political subjectivation uh, from perspectives that critically foreground differences such as class, race, gender, ethnicity, and sexuality across national boundaries. So the event today, uh, dedicated to white sight, uh, uh, bears much affinity uh, with a political inflection of our collective research effort. And also, uh, most importantly, maybe with the conjuncture that we are experiencing in the layered and entangled time-space manifold that is contemporary Italy, uh, which is where we're speaking from, from this white space, <laughs> that it's Italy, complex white space. So uh, I would like to start by uh, offering a brief summary of uh, uh, some of the arguments, uh, many arguments. Uh, the book is a historical, it's got an historical depth uh, and also political, and it's got uh, many different, uh, it proposes a reading of the formation of whiteness uh, and race, uh, uh, which spans 500 uh, centuries. So I'm just speaking on some of these um, uh, theses and moments. Uh, then move on to its take on the role played by Italy in this process and conclude with some questions. So uh, one of the things that I was, uh, that I think it's uh, quite um, exemplifies uh, very much the point of uh, scholarship about whiteness, which your book uh, uh, is part of, is a contribution to, because it clearly shows there is a whole uh, uh, body of work that has developed uh, uh, over the past 20 years uh, dedicated to whiteness. Uh, it's, of course, you know, the, the, the visual element, but the general, I think, thesis of studies on whiteness is that, as with Simone de Beauvoir's thesis about being a woman, one is not born white, but becomes one. So white being white does not depend primarily on the color of one's skin, but it is a social cultural construction. It is a learned cultural system. So working with critical race theory and other studies that have also problematized whiteness, Nick argues uh, that white side is a key operating system of what it is to make whiteness. So white side is the operating system, system that makes uh, uh, a key operating system of what it is to make whiteness. So the contribution is about the construction of whiteness in the visual field, which is paradoxically based in its invisibility. I think that's an essential point of the book, is the way whiteness is made invisible. I think this point resonates with Denise Ferreira de Silva point about transparent subject. The transparency or invisibility of whiteness in the visual field is part of its power, is what uh, grounds its power. Uh, this invisibilization of whiteness is what allows it to operate as a transparent and unquestioned norm. But Nick's book starts from uh, a place of crisis of uh, uh, whiteness. You know, we had, uh, uh, he reads, you know, we can read uh, um, politicians uh, such as Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, and Georgia Meloni <laughs> as part of this uh, uh, kind of resurgence of whiteness. Uh, uh, the, the blondness uh, is very uh, apparent on this uh, of this whiteness, uh, uh, although Giorgia Meloni here is heavily photoshopped, we have, they have to say, uh, uh, that uh, uh, he reads as uh, uh, also based uh, a response to the general crisis of whiteness. So uh, Trump, uh, Bolsonaro, uh, Johnson and Meloni are also symptoms of this attempt to restore uh, whiteness uh, at the core of politics uh, in the face of its general crisis. Uh, there are two, I was struck by the way in which uh, uh, Nick uh, um, posits uh, two characteristics of uh, whiteness in the visual field. The way it operates both as a way of seeing and a standard of beauty. So it has these two dimensions. So it's a way of seeing 
Uh, and this uh, shows clearly in the book. These are some images uh, uh, taken from uh, the book uh, as a way of seeing uh, uh, whiteness implicates perspective. Uh, that is, uh, the construction of a space is defined by this uh, geometrical emanation or line of vision from a single point of view, which is the sovereign individual, uh, such as constructed at the end. I don't know if he agrees with my reading. And, but also what I was struck by is that it is also about uh, the vision from uh, uh, below, the view of the land surveyor. Uh, it's uh, whiteness is the, 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 the gaze from above that allows for land to be surveyed and parceled and allocated uh, as uh, divided as property. So, property. so it's about the creation of boundaries uh, and borders uh, and the property uh, relations. Um, this is clearly shown to be the case by the use of a number of visual depictions and histories of perspective uh, and land survey in colonized territories. As in today's Israel, to be white is to be placed above. Um, we've seen it clearly also in uh, uh, accounts of the stratification of Palestine, uh, Israel. And to survey from above uh, is uh, to identify the complacent gaze of the owner and proprietor. Uh, as a stand, so we also see uh, this Veduta Architectonica Ideale that references to the ideal city, and uh, the ideal city uh, also uh, so is seen from above, but also looking at the horizon, uh, where the horizon uh, describes conquest. Uh, this is uh, the opening uh, uh, towards the Atlantic. Uh, uh, which breaks with the Mediterranean. Uh, in fact, uh, as Nick points out, the ships that you can see are no longer Mediterranean ships. They're not galleys. They're ready for uh, sailing across uh, the ocean and they leave uh, from uh, the space of, of Italy. Uh, the second point that uh, uh, about whiteness is its constitution as a standard of beauty. So whiteness and beauty become identified through the abstraction from the visual field of classical antiquity and in particular sculpture, which also accounts for the key role of statues uh, as an object of contestation in contemporary strikes against uh, uh, whiteness. So on the one hand, the Apollo Belvedere, and on the other hand, the Venus Pudica. Uh, so the Apollo Belvedere is uh, the Apollo, the rapist, the one who rapes uh, Daphne, as he points out. And uh, while on the other side, on the other hand, Venus is the subject of violation, uh, who fa the found, the found the aesthetic hierarchy of race. So I was struck by the ways in which you point out how Apollo and Venus become Adam and Eve, you know, also in colonial depictions, but also the asymmetry between the standard of beauty of Apollo and, uh, and that of Venus, which reappears as Black Venus, Hottentot uh, Venus, uh, uh, as a Libyan. Uh, uh, Venus, I think, in one of the uh, drawings that you report. So one of my questions is that, is there a symmetrical construction between uh, Apollo and Venus uh, in the accounts of uh, uh, whiteness uh, as a standard of beauty? Uh, Nick points out that the overall effect, overall effect of white sight is not that of constituting an all-seen power, but a specific power to project a white reality a monohumanism with Sylvia Winter, uh, whereby failure to conform is punished with violence. So white side clearly interpolates uh, those uh, who consider themselves Italians to think about the role played by Italy uh, in the historical construction of white dominance. And this is a, a significant contribution, be uh, even because it takes us uh, also beyond what has recently become a new awareness of Italian colonization of Libya, Somalia, Ethiopia, Albania, and Eritrea. Uh, so this is the colonization, so the, the, the starting point, not always, you know, obviously there are historians who also pointed out this longer duration, but the focus has been on fascism and um, uh, colonization after unification. But White Side asks us to remember the crucial role played by Italian financial capital in the Renaissance, in funding Portuguese and Spanish colonialism, including the slave, Atlantic slave trade. So uh, the construction of Renaissance Italy's wealth on slave labor is clearly depicted in Livorno's Four More Monument by Giovanni Bandini. Oh no, sorry, that's Licitacca. 
uh, originally from the end of the 16th century. And this is a statue that also appears in contemporary novels by black Italians uh, as a kind of uh, a symbol of this, uh, um, the persistent or racist imaginary in uh, contemporary Italy. I would also like to add to that the um, discovery of, by Brazilian artist uh, Maria Teresa Alves of uh, uh, the wealth needed to construct uh, the Museo Diego Aragona Pignatelli Cortes in Naples, uh, also known as Villa Pignatelli, uh, but also Cortes. Uh, the fact that this uh, monument, a, a Neapolitan monument, uh, was built with a colonial plunder from South America. So the traces of uh, of Italian dependency, uh, wealth on uh, colonialism, on uh, Spanish and Portuguese colonialism is also accumulating. Italy's contribution on the construction of the whiteness dominance in the visual field uh, also refers to these visual depictions of the ideal city that we mentioned above, as well as the sculptural standards of beauty of the Apollo Belvedere and the Venus Pudica. In other words, Italy is thoroughly implicated in the historical making of whiteness at least since the Renaissance, and not only through Christopher Columbus or fascism, but materially and symbolically before that. As Whiteside suggests, we can no longer consider the past as something that has been literally left behind. But multiple pasts compose the present in a process of recursive iteration that reconstitutes anew the dominance of Whiteside. Only last week, mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is uh, a new development. Only last week, uh, a new campaign, Open to Meraviglia, uh, has been launched aiming to promote Italy as a tourist destination through the website www.italia.it, which has as its center the image of Botticelli's Venus, who becomes the very image of Italy and which call, who calls herself I, Venus. So Italy is Venus, is I, is Botticelli's Venus. A blue-eyed, cherry blonde, photoshopped influencer, Venus, dominates a visual field emptied out of human beings. She's at the center of this visual field as a body to be looked at, but through a handheld digital screen, she also engages in the process of looking at herself by making a selfie. This emptied out monumental idea in Italy, represented by the Renaissance body of a very white Venus, photoshopped herself, is a product of the Ministry for Tourism of the Meloni government. Uh, we can thus read the Open Meraviglia campaign. This is more. Okay. So we can read the Open Meraviglia campaign, not only as it has been done as a rather incompetent waste of public money and a mediocre campaign, but also as part of the renewed violent effort of making and keeping Italy white against the threat, the old threat of ethnic uh, replacement, a process that cultural historian Carmine Connelli, in a recent book, has, has described as part of the very process of construction of the Italian national identity after unification. So the whitening of Italy, he says, has been an essential part of the project of the construction of the Italian cultural identity. Uh, this campaign offers a visual counterpoint to the images of black and brown refugees and migrants' body amassed on small boats crossing the Mediterranean from Tunisia and Libya or washed dead along its touristic beaches. So White Side is clearly a book that comes from an activist perspective, so it's a visual perspective. Uh, its background is a general crisis of whiteness, white riots, Black Lives Matter, the status toppling events in South Africa and the US. So it is not just about understanding better uh, the operation of whiteness as a regime of dominance in the visual field, but also about how to make this understanding the basis for thinking of how to dismantle it. It is then in the spirit of that which Michel Foucault called a strategic analysis. If you want to struggle, these are the points where strategically you should apply yourself. This is what he's saying us. It helps to identify the visual field as part of the infrastructure of dominance and thinking about political strategies that have been deployed and can be deployed to undermine and reclaim it. The stakes are, for whites in particular, becoming worthy or earning the right to respond to CLR James' invitation, referring to a Hittite constitution of 1804 
which stated that no white man shall put his foot in this territory with the title of master or proprietor or acquired property, and that all of those who become part of this new republic will call themselves black, James says, these are my ancestors. They are yours too if you want to. To earn the right to partake in this legacy, you propose the notion of the white strike or the strike against whiteness that you derive from the feminist reconceptualization of the strike, as in Argentinian feminist Veronica Gago, the trans-feminist strike. So if the 6th of January 2021 was a strike to reconstitute white reality, you say the strike against whiteness as a feminist strike is about the transition to a colonized and decolonized, uh, uh, decolonizing future. The strike against whiteness makes whiteness visible as well as another world. It also requires to become aware of the power of what you call the wages of whiteness. That is the material and symbolic surplus value that is distributed to those who are identified as white, and it is what keeps the negative solidarities of white oppression strong. Again, there are resonances here with uh, Da Silva's thesis about the theory of value, a Marxist theory of value as based in the nullification of the value slave labor. So I would like to ask you what kind of forms the strike against whiteness might take when it carried out by those who benefit from the wages of whiteness, including Italians. Uh, the notion of the strike is also allowed for your, by your conceptualization of the infrastructure of whiteness, which you describe as a powerful uh, network connecting material structures in physical and psychic space. The notion of the infrastructure uh, is thus a correlate of the possibility of white strike and white power. So it makes it material, it makes it something that you can actually strike against. So the strike against colonial status, from your perspective, is not a merely symbolic uh, act, uh, but it is a mode of decolonial strike or strike against whiteness, because statues are an essential component of this infrastructure. So I would like to ask you to elaborate on the relation between the infrastructure of whiteness and the strike against whiteness as part of the work needed to earn the right to claim Haitian revolutionaries as our ancestors. Finally, I would like you to elaborate on the notion of the imperial screen with relation to the ongoing hegemony of the digital screen. So what do you think are the specific ways in which the imperial screen continues to operate in digital screen? In the 90s, Lisa Nakamura described digital media as a white space. Since then, we had webcams that do not see blackness, patterns of discrimination and the new Jim Crow digital code, as Wendy Chun and Rua Benjamin had pointed out, uh, that literally construct segregated digital spaces and discriminated algorithmic identities. What is the relationship between the user and the white subject, between the imperial screen and the digital screen? Thank you very much. Oh, and you can see the statue of uh, Italian uh, journalist Indro Montanelli, who during the war uh, operated in the Eastern Africa and took on uh, a 12 year old uh, uh, lover and admitted that uh, on television. And that was the subject of one of the most uh, uh, famous attacks against uh, the statues in Italy by feminist collectives in Milan with uh, pink uh, uh, paint uh, a few years ago. Thank you. Nick, is that okay if Marco also offers your, his comments and then you can maybe respond to both or would you like to respond now? No, let's, let's let Marco have his say and then, um, then we can bring everything together. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll be much shorter than Tiziana, I promise. Um, thank you for... Uh, I mean, being with us even remotely and writing such a thoughtful, nuanced, and really powerful book. I started reading it uh, two days ago, so I didn't finish it uh, admittedly, but, and I'm still processing uh, its many layers. It's really a rich book, so I, I apologize if my thoughts are not as clear 
and firm as I would like them to be. Um, one thing that I want to say that this is also for me in a certain sense an opportunity to go back to uh, a class that I attended as a doctoral student with uh, Professor Mirzov back in uh, uh, 2007, 2008, more or less, uh, at NYU. It was a great class, I have to say, not only for the um, great scholarship you introduced us to, but for the style uh, Professor Mirzov conducts his classes. Uh, he's, you, he sits there like quite casually, and, and then a conversation starts, and then he jumps in. He, he doesn't start by lecturing. Uh, so everyone really enjoyed the class for the way you manage the pace of it. Um, so hopefully today we can have some of that kind of uh, style of conversation. Um, I want to say a few things about white sight. Uh, for, I isolated more or less three features. Um, you describe it first and foremost as a controlling type of gaze, which aims at rendering the world seeable in the sense of measurable, quantifiable, and therefore uh, governable. Uh, from this perspective, white sight is not just the sight of white people, but a machine that white people use to make the world uh, manageable, as I said, to make it function according to their many needs. The machine of white sight is both, also as Tiziana was saying, material and abstract. It is material because, as you write, white sight is always supported by an infrastructure. This infrastructure has a double function. On the one hand, it offers the observer a vantage point from which to see uh, and monitor the world without being seen, be it a tower, the cockpit of an airplane, the deck of a slave ship, a gallery overseeing a factory floor, or a system of satellites. On the other hand, the infrastructure incorporates and deploys technologies of seeing and foreseeing that have been honed through centuries. Interestingly, the original function or one of the functions of these technologies um, is aesthetic, or more precisely, representational. You spend some pages uh, on the invention of Renaissance perspective and some illuminating words on the relationship between Brunelleschi's invention of linear perspective, which he invented around 1416, 1420, and the evolution of this technology for representing the world into a technology for mastering the world. One of the key presuppositions of linear perspective, as you know, is that the viewer sees without being seen. In Brunelleschi's uh, famous experiments in front of the, uh, the Duomo of Florence, the viewer stands behind the painting from which he sees the represented image uh, of, the, um, of the Battistero through a mirror. And of course, this is the principle also of surveillance cameras, the CCTV, the pinhole camera, the camera of the drone, which all take this dematerialization of the, of the observer a step further in that the viewer can be physically situated nowadays thousands of miles away from what is observed. So a third defining feature of white sight is that the observer is removed from the scene. And the first we said is that white side is a controlling type of gates. The second one is that supported by material infrastructure. And the third, that the infrastructure itself or the technologies embedded in the infrastructure remove the observer from the scene. So why is the observer removed? Of course, there is a practical reason, which is evident in every combat situation. If you're not seen, you can strike minimizing risk for yourself. But there is also an aesthetic reason. If the observer is uh, removed, uh, is not seen, he or she cannot lock eyes with the subject under observation. In other words, the process of mutual recognition and possible identification with the other is effaced by the way, uh, by this way of seeing aimed at domination. Against this way of seeing aimed at domination, you suggest that there exists an alternative of multiple alternatives um, a way of seeing which can be found in a host of aesthetic and activist practices. So I would like to ask you if you could articulate how the strike against whiteness, against the politics of transparency and invisibility 
has been an advance in the realm of cultural and artistic production, and whether you think that these alternative set of practices can also be understood perhaps as a set of alternative technologies. In other words, what, what are the defining features? I, I, I don't need a definition, but perhaps you can um, you know, bring them together again for us of the strike against whiteness. Is it just a matter of historically contingent alliances between subjects who do not conform to white heteropatriarchy or have cultural and activist practices developed a sort of counter code that can be handed down, um, understood, that we can learn uh, from? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nick, if you want now, I think uh, it would be great if you could uh, address those issues and then maybe we open up to the students. Of course. So, uh, firstly, thank you all for coming in to listen to me in this strange format today. Um, I deeply appreciate the care and the thought that Tiziana and Marco put into thinking with this book, uh, which has been a long term project in many ways. Uh, the image that Tijana showed of the perspectival drawing was in my PhD dissertation many years ago. But it's very concretely a production of the crisis that unfolded in 2020 uh, in this country, but of course worldwide, in which my sense was that whiteness entered into a general crisis, became visible as such, and that it's our task as strikers to keep that crisis current to keep it open, to keep the portal, as Aaron Dassey Roy put it, to a different future where, as Donna mentioned, another world is already visible, that we can continue that work. So let me begin by acknowledging a number of things. I want to acknowledge that I am on stolen land. This is the land to which I'm speaking to you from. It is originally the land of the Lenin and Anapi people, who were displaced from this land violently by white settlement uh, early in the settlement of North America in the 17th century, but still maintain a presence in the area. So I'm sitting in uh, an NYU building, just a few hundred meters from Washington Square Park, which was Sapo Kanakan in the Lenape period. It means tobacco field. Uh, tobacco was grown by the Lenape as a form of gift, to, to exchange with people visiting was rapidly turned into an extractive colonial product, uh, as we continue to see today in many cases. The same land later became known as land of the blacks under Dutch occupation, uh, which meant that Africans who were given a strange legal status of being half free were allowed to farm this land so long as they delivered food to the white settlement further south. You will all be familiar with the idea of Wall Street. What you may not be so familiar with is that Wall Street was originally literally a wall built by enslaved Africans to keep out indigenous people. And it is from the labor of those enslaved Africans then that there was a white settlement at all uh, in New York and later across North America. So it's important to begin from that position of acknowledgement, uh, to be aware that we're dealing with a history, as both the commentators have quite rightly pointed out, uh, is not one of recent years, but really of many centuries. And therefore, to understand that the work that we're engaged in will take time, but we have also made remarkable progress in the last several years. And before I begin just resp responding to the questions that were placed, I want to make one thing clear, which is as Tijana pointed out, we, we are not born white, we become white. This is very clear, for example, in North America, where up until half a century ago, Italians were not considered white, nor were Jewish people. In my own experience in England, I get a status which is not black. That is to say, I won't be arrested by the police uh, on the basis of my visual appearance. But it's also made very clear to me that I'm not properly English, because the question is always posed to me, where are you really from? with the implication being that someone who's visibly patently Jewish with a last name like mine can't possibly be from 
England, even though I was born there. So whiteness is a relative category, because when I arrived in this country longer ago now than I care to remember, uh, I immediately become fully white. I get all the privileges of whiteness, the wages of whiteness that Tiziana referred to. So it is not my intention or my desire to make people who are white presenting or white identified feel guilty. That's absolutely not the point. The point is much rather to say, what are our responsibilities? And my sense is that most people in the room, most people watching, will have at some point in 2020 been on a march or attended a Zoom or clicked on a Facebook post or something to do with the Black Lives Matter actions of that time, in which someone said, taking down white supremacy is the responsibility of white people. And I think we all agreed to that at that point. And all I'm asking is that we continue to do that work, even if it's not in the streets marching in the same way as in 2020, that we need to continue in that vein. And it was very interesting to hear in, in the responses a thread that was drawn out uh, by, by both responders to the important place of Italy, or more exactly, uh, cultures taking place in the country that's now known as Italy, uh, in the formation of whiteness and white sight. And again, I'd just like to, to make a couple of connections to what's happening on this side of the Atlantic. I mentioned Washington Square Park. Uh, the first statue that I will encounter walking from here into the park is one of Garibaldi uh, that was built at the expense of local Italian migrants, precisely in order to claim a place within whiteness. And so too has been the extent of Columbus statues across the United States that have always been built uh, with this intent to say Italian migrants to the United States should be considered white. Uh, the one in New York City was put up in 1892. Uh, it became a focal point for clashes between those supporting fascism in the 1920s and 30s uh, and communists of that period. And it's again become a focal point for debate post-2020. The only point on which the then mayor of New York City and the then governor of New York State could agree was that Columbus statue should not be removed because both of them were of Italian descent. And they placed New York City police uh, on guard around that statue for over a year and a half, permanent 24-hour guard. That tells you then that the statue is more than just a stone figure representing someone from the past. It is a key part of this infrastructure of whiteness uh, about which I have been speaking. And so both both the commentators asked me to say some more about the nature of the white of, of what white strike would mean. And this is actually, I'm glad we begin here, because this is the important point to take away. My argument here is, yes, we need to know what how whiteness has been constituted. We need to be aware of its practices, but not, not simply to extend our knowledge, but as a form of taking action. We learn about it in order to identify places where we might then engage with it and to continue the work. So this book then is really, in a sense, an excuse to have conversations like this, where we can share ideas, where we can intersect cultures. Uh, it's absolutely remarkable to see those images of Botticelli's Venus turned into a, an Instagram tourist and uh, looking a little like a Fox News anchor, kind of modeled to a certain standard of beauty, being deployed in this very active way. So that we are dealing then, as that image makes very clear, with a 500-year history of what I call in the book racializing surveillance capitalism. We want to think of that as a period. It begins in the Italian Renaissance but it continues to be active today. And I, to make that phrase, I bring together two scholars. Racial capitalism is an idea that was circulated widely by Cedric Robinson in his classic text, Black Marxism. And he wanted us to understand that race and capital were formed synchronously in Europe, in the Middle Ages, in fact, uh, and as a means of creating hierarchy amongst people who were 
visually indistinguishable, but come to seem separate, so that in English the very word slave derives from Slav, who are and remain indistinguishable from those people who might be enslaving them. We've seen a very practical example of this in Britain since 2016, where the prejudice against Eastern Europeans has been absolutely astonishing from people who claim white supremacy. In other words, then the whiteness has nothing to do necessarily with skin tone. It's all about creating hierarchies and creating a sense of power in relation to the processes of generating capital. At the same point, same time, I also wanted to intersect with the work of media scholar Simone Brown, whose wonderful book, Dark Matters, which I recommend to everyone, uh, talks extensively about this idea of racializing surveillance. And in the way that I do, she connects it to the histories of enslavement and of colonization. So whereas I think in a lot of critical scholarship that I grew up with, we were all thinking about making breaks and uh, talking about ways in which there was a radical transformation, say, in the early 19th century or in the 1970s and so on. Here I'm wanting to stress a continuity, a layering, which forms what I've called white sight as a kind of layered, sedimented practice in which these past means of visualizing and ordering and hierarchization are all present, even if they're not always visible. They can sometimes, sometimes pop back into sight, as it were. So the contemporary metaphor for this will be the Photoshop image, which is, of course, built up by layers. Not all of those layers are necessarily visible to the person seeing the finished image, but they're nonetheless there, and you can explore them. In order to strike against whiteness, then, I'm asking us to do a series of things. I think it begins with the practice of refusal. And we can find this in the heart of the canonical Western tradition. Again, two miles south of where I'm sitting now in Wall Street in 1856, the writer Herman Melville created his story, Bartleby the Scrivener. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but this is a story in which a lawyer employs a young man called Bartleby, who's identified as a pale figure, so he's he's visibly white. And the office is concerned with copying contracts for capitalist firms. That's his basic work. Uh, it's not involved in prosecuting. It's not doing law in, in, in court. It's finance capital. This is in the decade of the 1850s in which the Fugitive Slave Act had been passed, allowing slave owners to reclaim people they said were enslaved and take them back to slavery in the South, as famously happened to Solomon Northrup, which gives us his narrative that was later filmed, 12 Years a Slave. In 1857, the Supreme Court, which was then as now part of the problem, declared that Africans had no rights the white people were obliged to respect. So it's in this context that this story is taking place. What happens one day is simply that the lawyer asks Bartleby to copy out a contract and Bartleby turns to him and says, I would prefer not to. And the lawyer can't understand this. He, may, he can't make any sense of this idea. How can you prefer not to do the work that I'm telling you to do? But he won't. And this continues. And other people in that office also begin to use the language of prefer. They talk about what they would prefer to do rather than what they are being asked to do. So the strike spreads. And it ultimately then Bartleby is fired because he, he won't carry out the work of circulating capital. But his strike does not stop because it's a general strike. And this is in the sense coined by Veronica Gago, as Titiana rightly mentioned, that the strike is against the whole practices that make an idea of racializing hierarchy or racializing surveillance capitalism possible. And that we then don't just strike against the rules of our labor, but against the way in which the social is constructed as a whole. So Bartleby then refuses to eat. He goes on what we should call a hunger strike, as had many people who were being brought into slavery. The historian of slavery, Marcus Redeker, 
calls the history of slavery that of a 400-year hunger strike. People refused to eat so that they could not be taken into slavery. We've seen in the 19th and 20th centuries suffragette movements refusing to eat. We've seen this in the struggle to liberate Ireland and the current struggle to liberate Palestine. So the hunger strike has been a technical weapon when pushed. I'm not asking you right now to undertake a hunger strike. I, I, I want to stress that. But I do want to say that refusal is the part, is where this begins. And it's a refusal to go along. It's a refusal to just accept that things are okay. Let me give you a practical example of this. During the Black Lives Matter movement, I went into a discussion with a man called Garnet Cadogan, who's a black writer who comes to New York uh, for the processes of writing an essay for an atlas of New York City that was put together by the writer Rebecca Solnit. And one of the things that he found was that as a visibly black person, there were certain things he could not do in New York City. For example, he could not run because if he ran, the police would assume he was a suspect. He also could not carry his phone in his hand, which is where most of us, of course, keep it, because, again, police might mistake it for a weapon. And as he spoke, I realized that pretty much every day at that time, what I was doing was running across Washington Square to get to the train because I was always not keeping good time. And in my hand, I was carrying my phone to keep an eye on the time. Now, I thought I was running for the train. One of the things I was also doing was demonstrating white privilege and using it. So now I don't do that. I walk. I miss some trains. There are worse things. This is, that's, a, that's a very small example that goes all, builds all the way up to the hunger strike and the refusal to accede to power. In between times, in 2020 in particular, we invented a series of tactics that clearly have begun to change the dynamics of the relational white side. We need to continue those. So the first of these is simply removal. We began removing statues. Statues, as Tetiada nicely outlined for you, are not just a representation, if you like, of white sight. They are its actual form. The whiteness imagines itself as a statue, particularly the statue of the Apollo, and that in 19th century racializing texts that attempt to distinguish between white form and other forms of being human, it's the statue then that's used to depict white people, not any individual human form. Whereas other types of human Africans, for example, are drawn in human form. A statue is the very form of whiteness, uh, and it becomes, in the, in the United States, the figure of Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general, takes over from Apollo in the late 19th century. So it was then no coincidence that when activists in this country decided to follow the path taken by South African students in 2015 and try and have the statue removed from Charlottesville, Virginia, it was a statue of Robert E. Lee. And both sides understood the stakes. So then 2017, shortly after the election of Donald Trump, an avowed white supremacist, what other white supremacists gathered again in Charlottesville to defend the statue of Robert E. Lee. Now, that statue is now gone, I'm happy to say. And many other Confederate statues have been removed. But the scale of the problem is actually, is actually quite immense. We are looking at 48,000 monuments and statues in North America. Overwhelmingly, these are white men. Overwhelmingly, those white men are also soldiers, uh, whether having participated in the colonization and settlement of the United States or other wars. And so the labor of removal is still immense. But the symbolic damage that's been done to white supremacy by removing only a few hundreds of these statues is, is palpable and notable. Uh, and we're happy to see statues like the awful statue of Theodore Roosevelt, the former United States president that was outside the American Museum of Natural History for many years, now gone. And what has happened with that removal is that, as it were, we have gone into the museum. We are now questioning the practices of the museum itself in sustaining and deploying ideas that 
support concepts of racial hierarchy and segregation amongst people. And that's exactly what the museum uh, was afraid of, that we would start to question what goes on inside. So we have to continue that process of removal. We have to continue the processes of repatriation of looted artworks and cultural property that form the bulk of European and North American museum collections. Because again, these objects embody the idea of racializing hierarchy. And we have seen, of course, the enormous resistance in Britain, for example, to the return of the Parthenon marbles, which are somehow said to be more appropriate in London than they are in Athens, where a museum has been built properly to house them. But they remain. So that work needs to continue. We need to think, too, about how to repair. And we're starting to see dialogues about that, about reparations, about ways of thinking through. For example, in this country, we have had to think extensively about the fact that everywhere we are is stolen land, that there are still 526 indigenous nations, sovereign nations, recognized by treaty as having the right to exist, creating what the Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson calls a nested sovereignty, that there are different kinds of sovereignty at work. We need to think those through. There's much more to say, but what I what I want to stress then is that the strike is not something that you do as a process that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, a, a, an event, excuse me. Uh, but it's rather a process. It goes on. It, you can take you can take time off from it. You can you can have breaks. It's not something you have to do 24-7 as you would have to do in the traditional labor strike. We continue to figure out ways to engage in it. To move on to the second point in relation to the, the screen, the imperial screen and the digital screen. This, this creates a resonance for me here. I was, uh, in 1999, the first introduction to visual culture that I wrote begins with the sentence, modern life is lived on screen. And I got in so much trouble for that. All the art historians rained uh, on me for, for, for years afterwards. And yet here we are, literally, right? I mean, I'm on a screen as you're watching me here, and I'm, I'm watching you via a screen. So that, but... I think that what I have understood through doing this work now is that that process is, again, a culmination of centuries of work. Uh, and and this, is, this has been established by many digital scholars, not least my, uh, my former colleague Anne Friedberg in her work, The Virtual Window. But in this particular instance, I want to emphasize on this. The transition from a settler colonial modality of perspective that was nicely outlined uh, by Tiziana in her presentation, to an imperial perspective in the 19th century. One of the reasons for this, one of the major reasons for this, uh, was the continued resistance of those who were either colonized or attempting to be colonized by European powers. In 1857, India rose up in what is now known as the First War of Independence, although the British still uh, remarkably referred to this as the Indian Mutiny. Because then as now, they could not understand why Indians might not wish to be ruled by British people. And in imagining a different kind of imperial world, the art critic John Ruskin told his students in 1859 that what they needed to do was imagine a giant screen between them and the world. It was to be a mile high, a mile wide, but infinitely thin and infinitely strong so that there was no reflection of them on the screen and there was no refraction between them and what they were seeing. And that you would then move around the perspective on the screen in a gesture that I think is now very familiar, right? To identify the particular part of this enormous screen that you were going to depict. And that sight line, as he calls it, looks very much like a rifle sight. And that's precisely what it was used for. It was used to target and to enable the astonishing massacres that were perpetrated by imperial warfare throughout the 19th and early 20th century, which the scholar and curator Dan Hicks has recently called World War Zero, 
because there were wars every single year. One of the things I would stress in thinking about this history is Ruskin then told his students the things that he wanted them to draw were landscapes, portraits, particularly those of what he called great men, uh, and animals. Now, that category is very familiar to me. It's the kind of imagery that we mostly see on Instagram. And so one way of saying this is to say that Ruskin was imagining an imperial Instagram, which is true. But the other way to say it is that Instagram is an imperial formation, that it continues that history. And there's one of the reasons for its continued and ongoing success is that it resonates with this long history behind us. We need to think about how this screen has in our own time then, of course, obviously become decentered. And this was a point that Marco stressed uh, in his comments, that the closed circuit television with which we are surrounded I'm told that in London, if you spend a day in London, you will be filmed at least 300 times. That These screens now operate as this modality of top-down surveillance through which we cannot but be seen. And we must make ourselves visible to them in order to gain access to buildings, to public space, uh, and indeed just to carry out the functions of everyday life. We cannot but be seen in this way. So that we have to then think about uh, modalities of striking against that kind of surveillance. In the Occupy Hong Kong movement, or Occupy Central, as it was also known in 2018 and 19, one of the first actions taken by strikers was to get up on ladders and spray paint closed circuit television cameras so that they could not be identified. But there, there are now so many cameras that that action would be, I think, almost impossible. When I was first in New York, and Marco may remember this, there were a group of activists who called themselves the surveillance camera players. And one of the things that they would do was to take you on a tour to show you exactly where all the surveillance cameras were. Now, such a tour would now be absolutely impossible because you wouldn't be able to get in the the 45 minutes or an hour you might have for such a tour. You wouldn't get off the first street in which you began. So we are now confronted by this surveillance that's that's so overwhelming. And yet at the same time, it fails to function precisely because it's everywhere. It cannot manage the data that it collects. So, for example, when there was a shooting on the New York City subway uh, a year ago, the immediate call was, well, where is the closed circuit television data? And it turned out that that particular camera was not working. I suspect most of those cameras are not working, in fact. Uh, It it seems too much of a coincidence that only this camera uh, would have been broken. In other words, the cameras are more an idea. It more wishes to tell us that you are being watched and therefore you need to adjust your behavior accordingly. One of the things that the global justice movement that Donna mentioned in her opening remarks taught us was to act as if we are free. In other words, to act as if you are not under surveillance, or even if you are, to to carry out those actions regardless. So that in the 2020 actions, it was always very clear what was going to happen. Nobody tried to uh, conceal or to hide or to uh, deny the kind of work that, that was being done. I might pause here. I think there's there's a great deal more that I could say, but I think I'm going to pause here. uh, And perhaps uh, people that who originally spoke might might have some follow up questions, or we can then open it to questions from the floor. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, This was amazing. Okay. Um, I I just want to say a couple of things and then leave uh, leave the floor to the students. So first of all, I think that also something your book does in an amazing way is to decolonize academia. We hear so much talking about uh, decolonize academia. It has become like a hype in the media and in academia itself. But you do a marvelous job in quoting scholars that are coming from non-West. You know, and this is, uh, again, an effort that we we should all make uh, because we keep when we teach our classes, we keep proposing the same theories that are mostly white men coming from the West. Right. Uh, And I think you have an um, 
a marvelous amount of literature that points out to other universes that should be explored when it comes to these issues. Uh, so that was something I want to bring up. Uh, um, also something, uh, because we have also our students uh, doing digital media culture, I feel that I want to emphasize a point that uh, Marco made and then you also responded to, which is this idea of like uh, the, the machine of white sight making things uh, seeable, but also measurable, uh, which really connects with what is happening today with coded bodies or the coded gaze. Uh, so the culture in which we live increasingly measured by algorithms, increasingly measured by metrics, recommendation system, and quantified. So how to escape this? And also, because you, you, you said also something very important, which is that whiteness or white ways of seeing are embedded in the machine itself so that we do not see it. And I recall this um, uh, documentary called Losing Lena. I don't know if you have seen it. Uh, sometimes I play it in my digital media culture classes, uh, where it basically tells the story of a Swedish model. Uh, back in 1972, Lena, this Swedish model, was taken, she was uh, posing on the cover of Playboy. And uh, the people who at USC, so again, uh, in the hearth of uh, whiteness, uh, 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 the white system of education in the United States, uh, took that uh, thought that it was a good idea to take this picture as a model to train the algorithms at the time. And so that, that picture of whiteness and a gendered body, of course, a female, became the standard of seeing for the JPEG format. You know, So ways of seeing... Uh, uh, I mean, white ways of seeing and gendered ways of seeing are now embedded in the format that we call JPEG, which we use on a daily basis without knowing uh, what is coded, uh, uh, embedded into it. Uh, um, so, yeah, I just wanted to bring this up. Uh, um, these are all, these are all very important points, and so let, let me respond to them if I can before before other people uh, might also want to follow up. The point on decolonizing is fundamental, absolutely. Uh, and there are two things to remember here. One is, of course, that decolonizing is an old process. It begins usually at the precise moment of colonization. There's a legend in Australia that the first thing that the indigenous Aora said to Captain Cook was, go away. And certainly it's true that almost all accounts of colonial practice end with the colonizer firing a weapon, attempting to kill someone. There's a shield in the British Museum called the Geagle Shield, which was taken by Captain Cook on his first landing in Australia uh, in 1779. And it has a round hole in the middle of it. And the descendants of the man Cooman who carried that shield, who was killed by the British Museum, British Marines, have asked for the shield back. Uh, the British Museum refuses to do it. And not only that, they deny that the perfectly round hole in the middle of the shield was caused by a bullet. They claim that it was a spear. Now, a perfectly round spear going through a thick wooden shield? I don't think so. But you will also remember from your semiotic studies that Charles Sanders Peirce argued that the very form of the index is precisely the bullet hole. But it turns out that in the regime of white sight, indexicality is not what it seems, that only certain points are considered indexical. That's the long history of decolonization. In the short history, if you like, of the actual practice of decolonization in the 20th century, we've seen an extraordinary generosity of thought from the formerly colonized. Tatiana mentioned C.L.R. James, the intellectual from Trinidad, and who I knew very, very slightly, not personally, but because he lived in Brixton when I was a young man, and I would go and see him give presentations. He was a sort of towering figure on the British left of those days. But we didn't, I didn't yet know that he had written as long ago as 1938, a history of the Haitian Revolution called The Black Jacobins, which is still one of the standard texts. And one of the ways in which we need to decolonize is to simply understand that the Haitian Revolution, as Tijana mentioned, is far more radical, far more thoroughgoing, and far more consequential than either the British, French, or American revolutions. No disrespect to any of those revolutionaries, but nonetheless, because of 
its thoroughgoing abolition of slavery in its opening clause. The Haitian constitution says slavery is abolished forever. And for the abolition of any racializing hierarchy, that, as was already mentioned. If we want to connect with these long histories, we have to be aware of the work that's been done. We have to think through, I think, in my own academic career. When I was a student, Franz Fanon was considered too radical, too, too violent to even discuss. It wasn't until 1996 that the conference held in London called The Facts of Blackness opened the door to non-African scholars to be beginning to think about black skin, white masks. And it was really, I think, the student movement in South Africa that pushed the wretched of the earth back into global attention where it should have been all along. And one of the things that Fanon says in The Wretched of the Earth is very simple and very, very clear to me now, where he says, colonialism is a world of statues. And as we know, in when we're thinking about decolonizing, we do not think in terms of metaphors. And Fanon did not speak about statues in that way metaphorically, he meant them literally. One of the first acts of the Algerian revolution, when it gained power in 1962, then on the very day that they gained power, was to remove French statues of colonizers from public space. In Angola and in Mozambique, where that movement spread down Africa in the 1960s and 70s, statues were being removed while the fighting was still going on in the streets. They were considered to be that important. So we need to, we need to pay attention to those legacies and to that critical thought and to the internationalism of that critical thought, which has long been a central feature uh, of its work. And to, but finally, by way on, on this point, by way of example, to see how the power in those formulas continues to be very active. In November of 2020, in Bridgetown, Barbados, which is the capital of the island, which was in the 17th century, the place where the greatest amount of wealth was produced in the entire British Empire because of sugar. A statue of Lord Nelson, who was a British admiral, who has a still has a large statue in the middle of London called Trafalgar Square, was removed by activists because Nelson had been a colonizer in the West Indies, and it was also married to a woman who brought money into his family directly from slavery. From that moment, a conversation begins in Barbados about whether or not the country should continue to be a part of the British Commonwealth, which made the then queen, now king, I find this very hard to say, um, made them the head of state and made Barbados's law technically subject to British law as well. And that happened, and we had a what was familiar from my childhood, a decolonizing ceremony in which the British flag was taken down and a new independent flag was raised. And it was a kind of shock to see that this process, as it were, continues. Almost immediately, the Prime Minister of Barbados announced in the following week that she would instigate the creation of a museum of slavery in Barbados. Now, you could argue in a certain sense that Barbados is a museum of slavery. The whole island uh, is covered in sugarcane, even if it's not being cultivated, it grows wild, that the land is still visibly marked by the traces of plantation. But there is nowhere at present where you could go and receive an informed analysis and history of the place and the power of slavery in Barbados. There's no museum of slavery in the United States. We have finally a museum of African-American history that has in its basement a informative but necessarily limited display on the history of slavery. In Britain, people continue to celebrate the fact that Britain abolished slavery without ever speaking about the fact that the reason they needed to do so was they had been for over two and a half centuries deeply involved in the practices of slavery. And we have seen, for example, how the work that we are doing in continuing these decolonizing processes reveals history to us, not conceals it, as is so often and misleadingly said. For example, you will know that in Bristol, the statue of the slaver Edward Colston 
was removed and thrown into the sea by activists in June of 2020. It's a wonderful gesture. Spurred by that action, historians began to investigate precisely what Colston had been up to in the Royal Africa Company, which was the agency through which Britain conducted its slave trade. As the name suggests, the royal family was deeply involved in this history of slavery. And Colston, in fact, gave a large number of shares to the then king, William III. So when we talk about coronation and all this nonsense that's about to come up in Britain, we need to remember this legacy. In the cultural world, we need to remember that reparations were paid in the United in, in the, what's now the United Kingdom, then Britain, to people who had owned slaves, not to people who had been enslaved, but to those who had owned them. An enormous amount of money, which was only paid off in 2015. That money was used to found, amongst other things, the Tate Gallery, the National Gallery, and other major forms of cultural work in Britain. So that these long legacies are what's really required of us to think through what it means to decolonize. It's not just a, it can't just be a trendy slogan that goes in and out of fashion as slogans do in academia and in activism. It's it's a lifetime's work, frankly, to, to think these things through. I could speak much more to this, but I shouldn't because I I'll, I'll go on all day. I want to take I take take on the second question of the of this of the machine. And it's absolutely right. Um, and, and the only thing I would add to this is that there's always been a machine. In colonial rhetorics, the plantation was understood as a machine. The ship was understood as a machine. And indeed, the ship was the most advanced technology of its day. And one of the reasons that Europe was able to colonize in the way that it did was to create these highly efficient technological forms. We've seen in the work of Christina Sharp and other Black feminist writers, the way in which the figure of the slave ship continues to dominate and to figure in contemporary Black imaginary as a key figure. And here uh, Sharp has used, too, the figure of the African migrant attempting to reach Europe as a key way of understanding the legacy of that form of machine. It is, of course, true, though, that the digital machine, the electronic machine, incorporates and uses these visual structures. Your, your, your example was very nicely taken. Uh, it's obviously true that they operate a visual system that structures around the idea of perspective also. I can think, too, of how photography was visually coordinated around a figure called the so-called Shirley Girl, uh, which was a photograph of always a very light-skinned white woman, which was used to calibrate the arrangement of colors in photographic film that was then, as you say, transferred into digital technologies. So my sense is then that there are certainly contemporary ways in which these forms structure and organize whiteness. Uh, you can think about the ways in which digital spaces actually refer to themselves as white space. Uh, the space where servers are stored is usually painted white. Uh, they say in order to make it easier to keep it clean, uh, so you can see the dirt, but I think there's clearly also what has been called a techno-aesthetic at work here, that the digital is in some sense inherently and inevitably white, and that other technologies from other parts of the world will continue to be referred to as dark, and that will continue to necessarily imply some inferiority. So it's very important to continue uh, to call that out. And then to think, and I think this goes back to a conversation we were having in the, in the sort of warm-up period, we can no longer rely on corporate platforms to, to serve as counterpoint technology, if you like. We, we've had that luxury to an extent. We've been able from, from the moment of Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring in 2011 uh, through to the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, we've been able to, as it were, co-opt corporate platforms to spread a message of resistance and strike. 
I don't think that's long any longer possible. I mean, I'm seeing a very practical example of this in that uh, the posts that I try and make around events like this or the work that I'm doing in relation to white supremacy in general are simply buried by the algorithm now, uh, that nobody sees them and no one's aware of them. So this is a, a very real and material question then. If we have become so dependent and so uh, tied and linked and connected through these systems, how are we to now imagine a digital practice that isn't wholly co-opted by the platforms. And obviously this has been tried many times and uh, we have often not been able to, to create alternatives that have stood up. But we're going to have to think about something now. Uh, and that, that's a question that I'd like to pose to, to everyone in the room. Think about you know, with your different practices and different understandings of digital technology as so-called digital natives, um, which is in and of itself a very colonial term, I have to say, uh, what what that world would look like to you. Well, okay, so that, that's a question for the audience, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if uh, anyone wants to respond or maybe as a comment. Uh, I hope you guys don't feel intimidated by the conversation. I, I would very much like actually you to jump in and ask things or respond to what we have been saying. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, no, exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we have someone who's not a student, <laughs> by the way. But... Yeah, I think uh... I was waiting for a student to say something, but I'll just quickly, because I know that everyone is talking about AI and chat GPT, and maybe you could just comment on how these <clears throat> technologies are extending this um, thesis of white site. I imagine part of it has to do with that data is white in certain ways. I, I think that's probably true. I think one of the things we've seen, and there's been a good deal of work on this, is that what does artificial intelligence do? It looks around at the ways in which humans are using information, and it extrapolates from that. So one of the things it has visibly seen is that humans are racist. And so it has decided that then that's what it should be. And so the platforms have had to do this kind of work to try and restrain their artificial intelligence from being like us. So and this is not quite working. They can't quite figure out how to stop the platforms from mirroring what's actually happening out there, which is, you know, it, it is the practice of racializing hierarchy. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned this because just yesterday I, I was writing a post about what is the current epitome in the United States a white site, which is this moment in which a 16-year-old called Ralph Yarl uh, walks up to a house in Kansas City, Missouri, because he's looking to pick up his siblings from a play date, but he's picked the wrong house. He's gone to 115th Street, where he, ne he needed to go to 115th Terrace, which is the adjacent street. And when he knocks on the door, which is a glass door, a window, a screen, the elderly white man behind it, seeing him, reaches for a gun and shoots him. Uh, luckily, he's not a good enough shot uh, to have seriously wounded him. But nonetheless, this moment to me epitomizes what white sight is right now. But we can extrapolate from this too. Why did the shooter shoot? It turns out that, to my not particularly great surprise, as an elderly white man, he was an avid consumer of Fox News. And Fox is a machine, if you like, that is dedicated to the dissemination of the mythologies, hierarchy, symbols of white supremacy in, in a particular form of affect, which is to do with anger and anxiety and, and being armed. And so he simply acted this out. Now, that's what the artificial intelligences are going to find. If they, if they are scraping the internet, that's what they're going to find. And what they do with that, we should be cautious about that, I think. There's a, there's a small incident that struck me uh, in 
2020 in Libya, the ongoing conflict there, people are now using quite cheap drones that are manufactured largely in Turkey. Uh, in this case, a kind of drone called a Kargu, which is spelled with a K, K-A-R-G-U. It's a cheap drone. And it, it, what it is actually is a, is a suicide drone. It's, it attacks things by flying itself directly into the target. And so there's a conflict going on. Uh, they're, they're attacking a convoy, and the people in charge of the drones send a command to abandon the attack. They, they've done what needs to be done, but the drones decide otherwise. They decide that the attack needs to continue. And so they continue to act and attack, as it were, autonomously. Now, that's, I think, because everything that they've learned tells them that a drone is designed to attack. So it makes no sense to them to say, no, it's okay, you, you, you're done attacking, Let, let's call it off. This was a small incident, unless, of course, you were one of the people who was being attacked by the drone, in which case it was an extremely serious incident. I'm not aware because the people that manufacture and, and operate drones are not really going to share this information unless they can possibly not of other such incidents. But I think we'll find when we when we finally find things out about what's going on in the Ukraine-Russia conflict right now, I suspect we'll find more examples of this. But all of this is to say that this is not an abstract question that we're talking about right now. The way in which AI plays our world back to us. We could use it, and I hope we will use it, as a sobering salutary lesson to say, you know what? We've been telling ourselves a bunch of, as Biden will put it, malarkey, about what's actually the practice. This system is showing us really who we are, and we need to address it. That said, you know, the... Uh, the practice of this technology is very much out out in the world now. Uh, and it's not going to be it's not going to be brought back in anytime soon. So, you know, I, I think the thing that people most have been worried about is Chat GPT is going to write student essays. I mean, you know, this is really the least of our worries, frankly. Uh, and we have predictive text already. I don't see that there's an enormous difference. These issues need to be addressed. The way in which you know. Uh, Sophia Noble and other scholars, uh, Ruha Benjamin, have shown that this is, this is as, you, as you rightly said in the beginning, this is written into the code. But that doesn't surprise me. It would surprise me if it wasn't the case, because then you would have had to have a, 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 a radical and systematic attempt to eradicate white supremacy from your action. And that is, of course, exactly what I'd like to see. I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, this, uh, these days we are talking a lot about chat GPT in the context of uh, cheating, uh, academic essays, blah, blah, blah. Whereas uh, I, I do very much agree with you that the issues at stake are, are much higher. And actually, we should focus on more kind of uh, timely and urgent discussions about uh, the ways in which these AIs are used. Um, but anyway, let me see if uh, anyone would like to jump in and maybe ask something okay yes thank you um is this on okay uh you mentioned how that uh acknowledging white sight and sort of dismantling it needs to be a sort of continuous uh work which i completely agree but how would you how would you go about if say for example you are faced with someone who would say I would say probably reluctant or has a difficult time accepting or wanting to learn or I guess harshly not really caring about this. Uh, I'm not in the conversion business. No, I know, I know, of course, but I I'm not saying like you have they have to be like indoctrinated with whatever you're saying, but I'm saying how would you go about that? Because sometimes these conversations are difficult to go about. Um, I think I think by simply you you simply can't, you you don't engage, uh, in my view. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that in 2020 we showed that there actually is an ex extant majority, at least in the United States. I mean, I'm not speaking about, you know, it's not for me to speak to other places. 
but that we already have a democratic majority. And therefore, then the point is to reassemble that majority around what we have already consented to. And as we do that, other people will be drawn in. Now, certainly, I think it's the case, and this is the, the, the physical practice of Occupy in the old days, was to sit in a circle, but to always leave a, an empty space so that anyone who was interested or curious could sit in the circle, come in. So it was never closed, right? And I think that's also important. I think it's important that we do create a sense of space. That's why I start out in these lectures um, that I give or do these events that I do by saying, look, I'm not trying to guilt you about this. I'm not trying to say that you need to be ashamed or any of those kinds of uh, gestures. The rather it's a question of thinking about this social responsibility that we took on collectively. Are you, are you, how do you feel about that? And one of the things I notice, and one of the reasons I prefer to do these events in public, is that often when I say that, there's an almost palpable shift in the affect in the room, that people, there's a kind of a dropping of people's shoulders, there's a kind of a certain tension goes out of the room. And that I th so that that I think is part of the way of doing this, right? Um, is is to is to think then through with without shaming and without guilting, but also to to call attention to what what people who are white identified white presenting have always been doing, working in alliance and association with radical movements. So I mean, I think you know the suffragette movement is one example that I often use because. Those people were very radical in the actions that they took. Uh, the campaign that I talk about in the book is the window breaking campaign of 1908 to 1914, where understanding very well that white heteropatriarchy created a screen between itself and the world, suffragette women in Britain went out and broke windows systematically. And they created specific tools with which to do that that had suffragette slogans on them. And the way it worked was you would go to a, a place, you would pick up one of these hammers, and you would be allocated a window to break, and it would be the size of the window would depend on the amount of jail time you were willing to do. The larger the window, the more jail time you got. And the, these windows were shops and businesses, but also museums. They were very clear about, you know, in, in the early 20th century, the museums played a key role in sustaining and disseminating white sight. Now, this is a radicality that we are very far from catching up to. You know, I, I think recently about the uh, climate activists who've been throwing tomato soup or some such uh, red materials onto artwork, which they have very carefully identified as artwork that's under glass and will not be damaged by this action. And so in the end, you could argue that the net effect of what they're doing isn't terribly much. By contrast, the suffragettes in the early 20th century went around and they slashed paintings that they disapproved of. Uh, most notably, in London, they attacked uh, uh, Velazquez called the Rugby Venus, which continued to be used, certainly when I was an undergraduate, and I'm sure it's still going on, uh, as an example of the male gaze. They had identified it in 1912 and took a knife to it. Uh, and one, the, the one that I most uh, often talk about is an attack that was made on a painting of Thomas Carlyle, who was the racist, xenophobic, pro-slavery, misogynist theoretician who came up with the word visuality as the means of understanding colonization. Uh, and the woman who slashed that painting said in court that she understood it her, in her view, it was now more interesting as a painting, and would, there would be more to say about it subsequently. And I think she's absolutely right. I think I would not be interested in a painting of Thomas Carlyle that hadn't been attacked by a suffragette. But the one that has been attacked by a suffragette, I find extremely compelling and powerful. So, in other words, then, what I'm hope, what I hope, try to do is to say to people, there's there's a tradition you can actually affiliate with that your grandparents, your grandmothers were involved in and that you might find interesting, you might find compelling, but it's it's not going to, it's not really worth, in my experience, if you find somebody that, as you know, 
that subscribes to the Make America Great Again agenda, the likelihood of winning that person over, as opposed to wasting an entire meeting or an entire session uh, arguing with them, is, is, is slight. And so it, we, we have a majority. It's our job now just to simply to cohere, deploy, and organize that majority. Okay, I think uh, there is a question here. It's going to be, unfortunately, the last question because I think we need to wrap it up. Okay. Um, hi. From your work and from your talk, I gather that you have like a close relationship with art and art history. And I'm guessing that you're aware of Nan Golden and her documentary, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. So I'm wondering how um, Nan Golden managed to hold museums accountable, even the British Museum for all the epidemic and through her program, The Pain, um, she managed to hold the secular family accountable, which this just proves that these institutions and museums are capable of changing and, yeah, capable of basically deconstructing what they've constructed because the, the secular family is one of their biggest donators, as I, like, from what I know. So I'm wondering, like, why do museums show so much resistance even though they're capable of changing since they prove it through here um towards this historically oppressive like removing this historically oppressive art pieces or art documentation or pieces of documentation that contribute to this like white supremacy infrastructure when there are even bigger movements demanding for this change because i know nan golden like it took her i don't know five years to actually manage a change but it was also a smaller movement than all of these um, bigger movements that you also described. It's a, that's a great question. Uh, Nick, uh, can I take another one? Because I said, uh, I saw, so just, uh, so you answer both. Yeah. Sorry, just a quick question. Um, I, actually, two, but you don't, I don't know, you don't, you can try to answer both. Um, I just, you really emphasize on white infrastructure, namely like statues. Um, I want to know how effective you think it is to uh, remove these statues. And is it the is it more effective than other forms of refusal? Because you really emphasize on it. And not that I don't think it's that effective. I just want to know why you think it's so effective. And um, also you discuss the difference between becoming white and white presenting. And I would like you to uh, go a little more into that because I'm sure uh, your rationale makes sense. But I think um, at first hearing it, it came off a little tone deaf to me. So I want to know what exactly you mean by becoming white and white presenting and how does one become white? Um, and yeah, thank you. Okay. Is that it, Donna, or do you have another question? Uh, no, I I mean, is anyone who wants to ask a question? Oh, there is a, no, no, you know, we have, we have been the icebreaker. <laughs> the room is heating up. Hi, um, you talked a bit about uh, Fox News. I just wanted to get your opinion on the recent uh, divorce, so to say, with Tucker Carlson and any um, issues that there may be impending with him entering the public sphere, creating a platform on social media and how that may perpetuate a uh, white site. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead, Denise. Okay, so uh, to, to, to these things, then obviously um, the, the Nan Golden's campaign was a very effective one. She brings together a legacy of activism. So in the film, you'll see they begin with a mic check in the Metropolitan Museum, which is an occupied tactic. They then do a die-in, which is an act-up tactic from the 1980s and 90s that Black Lives Matter, of course, also used very effectively. Uh, and they have the artistic and visual skills to make that event very compelling. Golden's heft, if you like, as, a, as an artist, is one of the reasons that she was able to start the ball rolling by refusing to allow her work to be displayed in the National Gallery of London unless they declined Sackler money in the Sackler name. So this was, you know, this is an example of refusal, as I mentioned earlier on, where she stood to lose, uh, to lose work and one of the things that she worries about a good deal in the film is whether the art world will drive her out or exclude her in some way 
And that was maybe a bit overdone, but it was obviously a real anxiety for her. So her star power, combined with the fact that once one place starts to do it, other museums feel that, that they needed to follow, they needed to identify. But we have not actually finished this process. I mean, Golden was in the Arthur Sackler Museum at Harvard University just this past week because they have not removed the Sackler name uh, and arguing that they should do so. Harvard have dug their heels in and they've dug their heels in on more substantive matters, which goes to the second part of your question. Harvard owns, amongst other things, daguerreotypes taken of enslaved Africans by a man called Louis Agassi in 1850. The lineal descendant of two of those Africans, Renti and Delia, have a woman called Tamara Lanier, has asked for those daguerreotypes to be returned to her. Harvard refused, the lawsuit has followed, and Harvard again, despite having been found by the courts to have a case to respond to, will not. They hold to some 20,000 items of human remains, primarily those taken from indigenous peoples of North America, including bizarre things like a collection of hair cuttings that they held on to. There's something at stake for these museums then in never deaccessioning anything. The principle of acquisitive colonialism or extractive colonialism seems to depend then on the idea of never returning anything. In Britain, the British Museum actually has a law that was passed in 1963 in the, in the wake of the first wave of decolonial demands for the return of looted cultural property that no item in the British Museum can be deaccessioned. Now, of course, you can pass another law that says that that law no longer pertains, but they don't want to see that. So something clearly is then at stake. And I think this goes to the second question where uh, someone was asking about statue removal. Why, do we, why are we focused on this? For two reasons. One is that, as I mentioned before, it is a tactic that decolonizing people have engaged in successfully from 1962 when Algeria begins removing its statues to 2015 with the Rose Must Fall action in, at the University of Cape Town that then spreads uh, across the Atlantic uh, to Charlottesville. And from, from there, really, it's gone worldwide. It is a, it's a crucial action because the statue is, as I've said, not an example of whiteness, but it's very formed. It's the way in which we get to understand how whiteness is formed and shaped. And the resistance to statue removal tells us an enormous amount about the presence of actively engaged in white supremacy in our own time. It is, I think, a tactic. It's a, it's a reasonable conversation to have now. Is it worth persisting with the remaining statues, of which there are very many? Or should we now begin to expand and develop on this tactic as we've seen? The example of Barbados that I mentioned suggests that there are powerful ways to, that statue removal can still open doors to understanding past histories. In the question of is the distinction between one is not born but becomes white, what I mean is that whiteness is not an inherent feature of human bodies. It is not to do related to any of the attributes that are often attributed to it by white supremacy, skin tone, skull shape, all the other supposed physical attributes. Rather, what we've seen over time is that different groups get to be considered white in inverted commas over time who were not previously considered to be white, which tells us then that it is a contingent category, one that's, um, that's deployed in the support of racializing hierarchy rather than the one that has any inherent meaning. So that tells us then that if, if, if it's possible to become white, then uh, then it has actually, as it were, no inherent or essential meaning. I use the term white presenting because as I look at a group of people like, as I'm looking at you now, I don't know your personal histories. I don't know what ethnicity or background you come from. So all I mean by white presenting is that you may appear to someone who knows nothing about you to have a history that would allow you to claim a white identity if you wanted to. 
So it's not a term in which I, I'm, I'm doing anything other than saying I'm not fully aware of the history that, that you bring to me. And in conversation with you, I can quickly learn about that. In relation to the deposition of Tucker Carlson, it's certainly an interesting moment, yes. And I think, uh, again, I, I, I have no expectation that Fox News will suddenly become a channel that I want to watch uh, or that it will take on the issues that we want to we would prefer to see addressed. But I think any disruption to the world in which a certain formation of white supremacy is unquestioned and driven, uh, any disruption to that is to, is just to be welcomed. Uh, it's extraordinary to see the extent to which a fairly small number of people who watch Fox News Tucker Carlson draws about 3 million people in the United States, on, but there are 300 million in the country. Somehow, this tiny fragment of public opinion has been allowed to become dominant, hegemonic over one of the major political parties in the country and has drawn Democratic Party, I think, into its orbit as well. That in itself should cause us to question how media circulate, how they dominate. One practical example of this is that even when Donald Trump is being sued for rape, as he currently is, media will disseminate 10 or 11 pictures of him in a short item, all of which show him looking as he wants to look, sort of fake tough guy. You could circulate a different set of photographs of Donald Trump and it would look, and he could look very different. Um, but Fox has become has, has claimed this place and it, it's able to do so because of the transnational networks of Rupert Murdoch, uh, who has had a good deal to do about the supremacy of neoliberalism in the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom. And he can afford for this channel to lose money, which I think it probably does, in order to extend and uh, develop his ideological campaign, which has been a successful one. Having been defeated by a Dominion in the lawsuit, even though he was able to deduct about 200 million of the 770 million that they were fined from taxes, has obviously given them some pause. And perhaps then we have finally reached the limit of what it is that racist white supremacists are entitled to say on broadcast networks, let's hope so. Nick, um, I want to thank you on behalf of the Communications and Media Studies Department for being here with us. And uh, next time, hopefully in person, I want to thank Tiziana Terranova also for being with us and Marco Deseris who apologizes, Nick, but he had to run. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I want to thank the Media Lab and the students, of course, for being here. Thank you, Donatella. Thank you. Thank you. Thank great you all. Technique. Thanks yes. for a great talk, Nick. And uh, we're looking forward to meeting you in person uh, as soon as possible. Ciao.